Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship here at Holland UCC. It is so good to have you with us this morning, whether you're here in person at the Momentum Center or folks who are tuning in from home. We're glad that you are with us. We're a community that is progressive, engaging, and inclusive, where everyone is welcome to the table. We believe that no matter your tradition or background, how you identify, who you love, or where you are on your journey, you are welcome here in this space. Well, we continue in this Easter tide to explore resurrection stories, and today we'll explore uh, the encounter of Jesus with the disciples, uh, minus one, doubting Thomas. Uh, well, he comes back. We'll get into it. And so we'll explore uh, that famous and familiar story of doubting Thomas together. Well, at the outset of our gatherings, we take a moment to seek to be present. We've arrived We're here. I invite you to lean back a bit in your chair, get comfortable. If it feels right, even close your eyes. And I invite you to take a deep breath in. Breathing in gratitude for this spring day and breathing out. <clears throat> breathing in hope, possibility, and peace. And exhale. And as we continue in our mindful breathing, we ring this meditation bowl which reminds us of the deep peace of God. your resurrection newness. We are in a liminal space between brokenness and new opportunities. We're hiding like the disciples behind closed doors with fear and doubts waiting for your appearance. Come into our midst now. Penetrate into our closed hearts, bringing your peace. Refresh us, O God, and empower us. Blow into us your gentle spirit. Amen. I should stand if you're able and join us for our opening song, I Owe My Lord a Morning Song. friends? Feel free to take a moment and offer a word of peace or just a hello to someone who is near you.
invite you to remain standing if you're able and join us in our litany, our litany this morning, a litany of solidarity. I'll read the regular type, together we can respond with the bold. Provident God, aware of our own brokenness, we ask the gift of courage to identify how and where we are in need of conversion in order to live in solidarity with all Earth's people. Deliver us from the violence of superiority and disdain. Grant us the desire and the humility to listen with special care to those whose experiences and attitudes are different from our own. Deliver us from the violence of greed and privilege. Grant us the desire and the will to live simply so others may have their just share of the Earth's resources. Deliver us from the silence that gives consent to abuse, war, and evil. Grant us the desire and the courage to risk speaking and acting for the common good. Deliver us from the violence of irreverence, exploitation, and control. Grant, Grant us the desire and the strength to act responsibly within the cycle of creation. God of love, mercy, and justice, acknowledging our capacity in those attitudes, actions, and words which perpetuate lives, we beg the grace of nonviolent hearts. Amen. And may it be so. You may be seated. Our verse for reflection this morning comes to us from Matthew 26, 52. Put away your sword, Jesus told him, for those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Our poem this morning is entitled Lockdown. Lockdown by Daniel Mankoff. We have been studying Hamlet, but now I am sitting in a classroom with 25 seniors in the dark. We are on lockdown. It is a drill. I am sitting in the dark with 25 18 year olds, old enough to vote old enough to serve in the military, old enough to fight and die. In this classroom, we are on lockdown. The lights are out and we are quiet. The lights are out and we are quiet because we have been told that light and sound are the two things that are most likely to attract the attention of a killer. So I'm in the dark with 25, 18 year old children and we are silent. We sit with our backs to the wall that the door is on because that wall is the wall where you cannot see us if you look in the window. In the dark, up against the wall, contemplating our deaths in silences, we are not looking at our cell phones. Cell phones make light. A lockdown drill is a 10 minute prayer. There's a moment where the administration yanks on the door to see if it's locked. My door has always been locked, but I wonder what would happen if it wasn't. The door would fly open. Then, would our principal pop his head into the room and shout, Bang! You're dead. There are more things in heaven and earth than we want to imagine. It scares me every time that door is jostled. I am told that the only answer to a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Other answers. A bad guy who never gets a gun. A bad guy who never learned that the gun was an answer. A world where we never invented guns. A world where the bad guy isn't a bad guy. Where a bad guy is just a guy. I am a teacher. I am the answer to a bad guy with a gun every day. I am the one who stands in front of 25, 18 year olds, old enough to vote, and soldier and shoot and die. And I am the answer to a bad guy with a gun. 
I don't teach guns, I teach poetry. I teach poetry and literature and art. Maybe if we could write a poem. Maybe if we could speak to each other with words, we wouldn't feel the inarticulate need of bullets. Do not put a gun into my hand because I'm a good guy already and I wield my weapon of words daily. The fluorescent overheads go on. Hamlet resumes. To be or not to be? That is the question. Lockdown by Daniel Mankoff. This time I'll invite our kiddos, kindergartners to fifth graders to join our UCC Kids Time. We'll be just down the hall here to follow Corey and Colleen for a time of story, lesson, and craft. Don't be shy, it promises to be fun. <coughs> and as our kiddos are making their way, I'll invite our reader forward. Good morning. Good morning. Words of Integration and Guidance by Jonathan Schell. Shall the world, at long last, say its farewell to arms? That unrealized vision is as old as arms themselves. It is necessary to add that today, too, the obstacles are mountains that the temptations of violence, including the longing for revenge, power, or loot, or, for that matter, visions of heaven on earth or of mere safety, still grip the imagination, that the quandaries facing the peacemakers confirm the best minds, that as old forms of violence exit, the historical scene, new ones enter, that in many parts of the world, Growing scarcity and ecological ruin add new desperation to the ancient war of all against all. That one day's progress unravels the next, that in some places nonviolence advances, in others barbarism is unleashed with new vigor and ferocity. It is difficult to make out, even in the distance, the outlines of a world at peace. I contend, nevertheless, that quiet but deep changes, both in the world's grand architecture and its molecular processes, have expanded the boundaries of the possible. Arms and man have both changed in ways that, even as they imperil the world as never before, have created a chance for peace that is greater than ever before. A selection of scripture from Psalm 16, as rendered by Dan Merrill. Remain ever before me, O living presence, for in you I am safe. You are my beloved, in you I can do all things. I look to those who are at one with you and learn from them of your ways. My delight increases each time I sense your presence within me. I bless the counselor who guides my way. In the night also does my heart instruct me. I walk beside the spirit of truth. I celebrate the light. Thus my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. I shall not be afraid nor fall into the pit of despair. In love's presence, there is fullness of joy. You are my beloved, in you will I live. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to John 20, John 20, 19. Through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they had seen the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. So I've always felt kind of bad for Thomas. You know, he got left out when the big event happened. Maybe he was out getting groceries or something. You guys send me out, and of course, I missed it. I hope you at least took some selfies, pics, or it didn't happen. And then, to make matters worse, Thomas has to sit with the sense of missing out, not just for a day or two, the text says, but for a week, a whole week. And he kind of has this attitude of, nice story, guys, but I'm not really buying it. I'm going to have to see it to believe it. And in a way, who can blame him? Yet he forever gets a bad rap, right? He becomes doubting Thomas, the disciple who missed out, the disciple who didn't measure up. But how do we know if any of those other disciples would have responded differently, right? He just happened to be the one who wasn't there. And so many of us have been taught that doubt is a problem. Doubt is bad. You don't want to be like Thomas, do you? And after all, Jesus says to him explicitly, do not doubt, but believe. And the takeaway we're left with is, doubting is bad, believing is better. Well, turns out maybe it's not quite that simple. For one thing, you really can't just believe your doubts away. If you've tried, let me know how that went. And if you try, I think in many ways you're setting yourself up for disillusion. The writer Madeline Langell says, Those who believe, they believe in God, but without anguish of mind, without uncertainty, without doubt, and even at times without despair, believe only in the idea of God but not actually in God. Or sometimes we believe in the idea of believing. Another writer puts it this way, a faith without some doubts is like a human body with no antibodies in it. There isn't any room for doubt. If you haven't listened and sat with your doubts, then when a crisis or tragedy comes or some hard questions, your faith could collapse overnight. So if we don't make space for doubt, perhaps we're setting ourselves up for trouble. Theolog the theologian Paul Tillich said, doubt isn't the opposite of faith. It's an element, a part of faith. And Anne Lamott went further, the opposite of faith isn't doubt. It's certainty. Because if there isn't any doubt, then what need is there of faith? Right? If you already know 
then at that point you just know, and there, we're not talking about faith at that point. And it turns out that doubt is an indispensable tool in staying alive. If you said, I believe I'm a safe driver, so I don't need to wear a seatbelt, that wouldn't be the best idea. Better to doubt both your own ability to drive perfectly safely and everyone else around you, right, who you can't control. So better to have a little doubt about getting from A to B safely than put on that seatbelt. And researchers have studied the importance of doubt in keeping us from believing everything we're told, in which case we could be taken advantage of, right? Advertisers would have a field day if we just believed everything we were told. We need a healthy amount of skepticism to keep from buying every product that promises us instant happiness, a perfect body, a perfect career, a perfect life. And what these researchers found is that people who had suffered localized damage to an area of the brain called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, that's VMPFC for shorthand, these folks were less likely to practice healthy skepticism or doubt and more likely to be taken advantage of by advertisers. Which means that part of our brains is hardwired to doubt. So doubt is a part of being human and essential to helping us learn and grow. Some years back, a member of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty was demonstrating against an execution in Alabama. And he was holding a sign that said, Jesus was executed. Well, it turned out there was someone else protesting in favor of the execution feels like an awkward thing to protest for, but they were there. And this person was a good church-going person and saw this sign that said Jesus was executed, and he took issue with it. And so he comes over to the guy, and he says, Jesus' death really wasn't an execution because it was the will of God foreordained for our salvation. And so what can happen is that we so theologize Jesus' death that we can forget, yeah, he was executed by the state. Paul Nuchterlein says, this is what Paul meant by the cross being a scandal. It's so hard for us to face what Jesus experienced that we want to cover over his death with a comfortable myth. Which brings us back to Thomas. I'd always assume that what Thomas was doubting was the reality of the resurrection. But what if he's doubting something else? Remember what he says, unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands and put my hand in his side. What if Thomas isn't doubting the resurrection but the crucifixion? What if he's doubting the fact that God would raise someone from the dead who had been executed? in utter shame. That puts this story in a slightly different light. Again, think of the disconnect of this churchgoer who was in favor of capital punishment. By believing that God needed, maybe wanted Jesus to die, planned for Jesus to die, we imagine that God needs violence. To accomplish God's purposes. And if God needs violence, well, then our violence is okay too. What is harder to believe for both Thomas and all of us is that God is not only not using and affirming violence, but the opposite, showing us the triumph of the way of peace and love and nonviolence. And you could argue that the violence done by a few in that single moment in history to Jesus reflected not just the few Roman soldiers who were actually doing the deed, but the violence 
all of humanity has believed in and committed, including ourselves. And yet God forgives our violence and shows us a better way. And so the doubt in question in our story perhaps isn't so much about the resurrection per se, but that the way of peace has truly triumphed, that the crucified one has been raised. And what we are invited to doubt is that our way of violence is the only way. And what we are invited to believe is that Jesus' way of peace is the better way. But of course, all signs point to us believing and doing the opposite. Instead of doubting our violence, we believe in it more strongly than ever before. Instead of understanding that words written hundreds of years ago may need to be updated to make sense today, we instead imagine that the Second Amendment is more sacred than Scripture itself. And when more school children get shot up, or folks simply going to the bank, or vacationers relaxing on the beach, the answer again and again in this country isn't to doubt the sacred right of violence, but to double down on it. The answer to gun violence, we're told repeatedly, is more guns. We need armed guards at every school. We need armed teachers. We even should be armed at church. Well, this all-pervasive belief in the power of weapons to save us from other weapons reminds me of the story of a village whose leader had an accident, hurt his legs, and needed to use crutches to get around. Well, it turns out that he took to the crutches quite well. He gradually developed the ability to move with speed, even to dance and do impressive little pirouettes for the entertainment of his neighbors. And he liked the crutches so much that he took it into his head to train some of the children in the use of crutches. And it soon became a status symbol in the village to use crutches. Before long, everyone was using crutches. And by the fourth generation, no one in the village could walk without the use of a crutch. The village school included crutchery, theoretical, applied in its curriculum. And the village craftsmen became famous for the quality of the crutches that they produced. Well, one day, a young man who had been reading some, quote, dangerous books, presented himself before the village elders and demanded to know why everyone in the village had to walk on crutches since God made everyone with two good legs to walk on. The village elders were amused that this upstart should think himself wiser than they, so they decided to teach him a lesson. Why don't you show us how, they said. Agreed, cried the young man. And so a demonstration was fixed for the following Sunday at the village square. Everyone was there. The young man hobbled in on his crutches to the middle of the square, stood upright, and dropped his crutches. Well, a hush fell over the crowd as he took a bold step forward and fell flat on his face. That day confirmed the belief for everyone that, in fact, it is quite impossible to walk without the use of crutches. When you believe something long enough, it is hard to imagine another way. But there are signs of hope. Signs that people are beginning to doubt the conventional wisdom and believe that there is a better way. When we see students showing up to state legislatures chanting for peace and for real gun reform while singing this little light of mine, there's reason to hope. When lawmakers are willing to join the protest, even at risk of losing their own positions, there is reason to hope. And when a state like our own, which has done nothing on this issue for four decades, now has elected officials brave enough to pass at least modest gun reform, there's reason to hope. When folks like Shane Claiborne are melting guns into garden tools, we might begin to believe that the old words of the prophet might still have some life, that they shall turn their swords into plowshares 
and study war no more. Because it is time that we doubt our conviction that violence is the way. It is time we doubt that more guns will make us safer. It is time we doubt our unshakable belief that our worship of weapons has anything to do with following Jesus Christ. It is time we stop doubting peace. We, like Thomas, need to see again the mark of the nails and put our hands in his side to remember that Jesus submitted himself in love to our way of violence and has shown us that it is hollow. He shows up in our midst, arrives as we cower behind locked doors amid our lockdown drills and our doubts that we could ever really be loved and forgiven and safe. He arrives still bearing the scars of our doing and says, peace be with you. That is something I want to believe in. Amen. Maybe so. But to stand if you're able, our song of response somewhere is Rise and Speak Out. Maybe seated. We have opportunity to give of our offerings at this time, so we'll pass these baskets around in just a moment. Reminder that we are supported solely by the generosity of our friends and members like you. Folks tuning in from home, you can also donate online via the Givelify app or going to hollanducc.org slash donate. And as always, out of God's generosity, we give, asking that God would use these gifts and us to turn our world upside down with love. Come gather round people, wherever you roam, and if the waters around you have grown,
Christy. Well, friends, we have time now to share some things that are happening with us. Anything that we would like to remember in prayer together or perhaps celebrate together, feel free to raise your hand. I'll come around with the mic and folks tuning in from home, feel free to post any concerns in the comments. What can we hold space for together this morning? I just want to share that Laura Johnson had hip replacement surgery Thursday, Friday. So just pray for good healing for her and speedy recovery, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. So for Laura, if you're perhaps listening, we're thinking of you and we'll hold her in prayer for this time of recovery ahead. So for Laura, we say, oh God, hear our prayers. Anything else we can remember together this morning? Yeah. Last week I asked for prayers for our daughter-in-law. Her father was, um, they feared he had cancer returned in his lungs, and they did the testing and they found all the scar tissue, and he's doing well. He's doing well. Oh, that's a celebration. That's a celebration. Well, for that good news, we'll say thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Okay, bear with me while I word this correctly. So I work in a school, and over the last couple weeks, I work in a school for kids with like developmental disabilities, and we're kind of used to the ups and downs of caring for them. The last couple weeks has been more staff-centered. We've had a staff lose a spouse. We've had a staff lose a child to overdose. We've had a staff have a baby and have postpartum depression. There's this, this wild assumption that if you are having bad things happening in your life, you need the coping skills and you need the prayers. This young lady and her baby and her new little family, it just has kind of raised the awareness that maybe broken and traumatized people don't know how to do positive good things either and they need prayer and they need the, the support just as much as everyone else so I know that our work environment isn't special in that way that everyone's got these people in their lives that have struggles and we just all really need to keep each other held up in prayer and in our hearts because it's it's so hard whether things are good or bad it's so hard it's hard to be human Absolutely. Thank you, Crystal, for sharing that. We'll certainly hold your colleagues uh, and families and <laughs> all of us in our prayers. So for uh, all of that was mentioned by Crystal, no doubt that applies, of course, to her workplace and colleagues, but no doubt in some way to all of us and all the folks that we know. We lift all of that up to God and say, oh God, hear our prayers. Other things going on. All right, well, we know there's more happening in our lives and in our world than we've given voice to here just now. And so if there's anything else uh, that you're holding on to, I invite you to lift that up to God in the silence. Stand if you're able and join us for our doxology, which we will sing as usual a cappella. Come thou from whom all blessings flow, wake us to see more than we know.
But you stick around, get a cup of coffee, a snack, get to know somebody new as we wrap up here in just a moment. And a few announcements before we part ways. If you're new with us this week, there's a welcome card in the back table. Feel free to fill one out and drop it in the offering box. A great way to stay in touch. There's a few things happening this week. Wednesday, Pub Theology, 6.30 at Grace Episcopal Church. Bring your own beverage and an open heart for good conversation on life and faith. Thursday morning, coffee, 9 a.m. That's at the Hayworth Hotel on Hope's campus in the lobby there, right near the Big B Coffee. Again, no agenda, just a chance for conversation and connection. This Friday in Grand Rapids is a UCC Climate Justice Walk happening at Chase Bank with the idea of helping uh, some of our larger financial institutions to divest from investing in and supporting uh, fossil fuels. That's going to be 3.30 at uh, East Beltline there. I think the corner of East Beltline at 28, if I'm not mistaken. Up the East Beltline. Okay, just up the East Beltline a little bit. Okay, there we go. Just a little bit north uh, from 28th Street there. Bring a sign. Bring your voice. And uh, next Sunday, uh, it's Earth Day weekend, and so we'll be having a creation care-focused uh, gathering next Sunday. And upcoming are some learn about the UCC classes. So if you have questions, what is the United Church of Christ? I want to know more about this. You might be a long-standing uh, member in this community, which means you haven't been around that long because we haven't been around that long. But uh, And you may be new and you want to learn more about the UCC. It's a wonderful chance to do that coming up in May. And then uh, the Grand West Association Spring Meeting in which we celebrate the retirement of our own Reverend Ruth Fitzgerald happening at Douglas UCC. Uh, we'd love to have uh, many of you join us for that meaningful time together. And if you'd like to join a supper club, there are signups in the back. There are also signups if you'd like to get more involved on a number of fronts. Uh, feel free to check out all of that. Any other announcements for the good of the whole? You can always go online to hollanducc.org for the latest. And so now as you go, let us step out into the world knowing that we are not alone when our doubts and fears surround us. The risen Christ is with us, empowering us and encouraging us to stop doubting his way of peace and to believe. And so may the power of resurrection and the peace of Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.